I want to welcome our visitors. We're glad that you're with us. It's good to see my dad this morning. I'm glad that he has uh, come uh, to visit with us. Uh, concerning the debate that took place uh, yesterday, I think it went very well. Both of the debaters uh, behaved themselves uh, pretty much in a gentlemanly manner. And so that's, that's always good and profitable when you're having a, a disagreement. Um, as far as uh, the approach that the preacher took, it was a little bit different than I would have uh, thought he would take, but he, it was effective in, in proving the existence of God and proving the Bible by some of the evidences that God does exist and that the Bible is the Word of God based on those on evidences. Uh, the atheist, pretty much his argument could be summed up in um, the concept of there's things in the Bible I don't understand, therefore there is no God. And that was basically, there are some here that heard that debate, and that's basically the, the gist of his argument. Uh, there's things I don't understand in the Bible that seem to be a contradiction, that seem to be even immoral, uh, therefore there, there is no God. And he did what most atheists do, make the argument from suffering in the world, where was God when the earthquake took place in Haiti and all those people are suffering? Where was God then? Is God loving? How could He let that happen? And so that's the basic uh, um, arguments. He, there was not really anything convincing, of course, uh, concerning what he was saying. Uh, but it's always good to set forth truth and error side by side. And truth will always... Uh, defeat uh, that which is wrong. Romans chapter 6, <clears throat> Romans chapter 6, beginning in verse 1. There are many questions in the Bible, many questions. One of the great tools and methods by which a person teaches and a person learns is through asking questions. And there is a question I want to consider in Romans chapter 6 and verse 1. Uh, Paul says, what shall we say then? Shall we continue in sin that grace may abound? Shall we continue in sin that grace may abound? Now I'm going to give credit to whom credit is due. This outline that I'm preaching this morning is an outline Jennifer put together. Uh, for a ladies' class that she taught uh, not long ago. And I knew I was going to be occupied at the debate yesterday. And so I said, I'm going to take your outline and I'm going to preach it. So if it does well, give credit to uh, Jennifer. And if it doesn't, talk to Jennifer about the, <laughs> the sermon. But uh, she put together a good outline. And I said, well, I'm going to preach that outline. And so we're going to look at that this morning as we consider... Questions. This question here that uh, Paul is asking. Shall we continue in sin that grace may abound? The theme of the book of Romans is justification through obedient faith. That's the theme of the book of Romans. In Romans chapter 1, verse 16 and 17, Paul writes, For I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it is the power of God unto salvation unto all those who believe, to the Jew first and also to the Greek. Verse 17 says, For therein the righteousness of God is revealed from faith to faith, as it is written, the just shall live by faith. So we see that the theme of the book of Romans is justification by faith, by an obedient faith. And in the remainder of Romans chapter 1, we see that Paul says that the Gentile world is in sin. They're in wickedness. They rebelled against God a long time ago. The descendants of Noah became very wicked and, and evil and they became the Gentile nations. And as a result of that, they violated the will of God. They've sinned and God's wrath is against them. But then in Romans chapter 2, Paul makes it very clear that the Jews are without excuse. They had the will of God revealed to them at Mount Sinai, yet they violated the will of God just like the Gentiles did. So they have sinned. Then you come to Romans chapter 3 and verse 10. It says, There is none righteous, no, not one. 
Romans 3 and verse 23, all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. And he says in Romans 3 and verse 8, some are declaring that we teach, let us do evil that good may come, as we are slanderously reported, and as some affirm that we say, their condemnation is just. Romans 3 and verse 8 is saying, this is what people are saying that we are preaching, let us do good, or let us do evil that good may come. That's false. That's a false accusation made against the preaching of the gospel. He's talking about grace in the context of chapter 4 and, verse, and chapter 4 and chapter 5. He talked about justification and how David talks about being justified before God. And Abraham was justified before God. And it was not based on works. And the works in context there is the works of the law of Moses. You cannot be ultimately justified by the works of the law of Moses. And so that's the point of chapters 4 and chapter 5. And so we come to chapter 5 and verse 20 that will bring us into chapter 6. Paul says, but where sin abounded, grace abounded much more. Where sin abounded, grace abounded much more more. And so, in chapter 6, which remember there were not chapter and verse divisions when this was written, he is going to dispel a false concept. If sin abounded, where sin abounded, grace abounded much more, grace is greater than sin, then some might come to the conclusion we should continue in sin that grace may abound. In other words, more sin, more grace. And if grace is greater than sin, then the more you sin, the more there will be grace, and the more God will be glorified. And he's just going to dispel that myth, that, that false conclusion to come to. Now think about this. If grace were weaker than sin, we would not have any hope. Because sin is so prevalent throughout the world. It's a problem. Problem. It's a universal problem throughout the world. All of sin. Romans 3.23 and falling short of the glory of God. So it is a universal problem that we face in the world. If grace, God's unmerited favor, God's willingness to forgive, was just as powerful as sin, we wouldn't know who exactly would win. Because they would be evenly matched. But grace is greater than sin. And therefore, grace, God's offer of salvation, can reverse the problem of sin that we place ourselves in when we enter into uh, the state of sin by our rebellion. When we become the people of God through grace and mercy in the gospel, then that problem is reversed. We are redeemed. We're brought back to God. So the question is in Romans chapter 6 and verse 1, what shall we say then? Shall we continue in sin that grace may abound? There are some in the religious world who would answer that question, yes. Oh, they may not answer this question this way uh, in verse 1, but in their doctrine, that's what they teach. The doctrine of Calvinism, the P in the tulip uh, acrostic, which says perseverance of the saints, or once saved, always saved. Once you are saved, they teach, you can never be lost. There, there's nothing you can do to, to fall out of favor with God. Now, He wants you to be obedient, but you don't have to be obedient. And so they teach that once God saves you, you're locked in. Nothing that you think, say, or do will affect your salvation because God does it all for you. He gives you faith. He saves you. He does it all. It's all from God, they say. And that's Calvinism. In fact, there's a website of one of the Baptist churches here in Roy City that actually says that once you get it, talking about salvation, once you get it, you can't lose it. Once you get it, you can't lose it.
Now, some are not as blazing as some of these quotes that I'm going to give to you. There was a preacher by the name of Sam Morris, a Baptist preacher from Texas. He says this, We take the position that a Christian's, Christian's sins do not condemn his soul. The way a Christian lives, what he says, his character, his conduct, his attitude toward other people, have nothing whatsoever to do with the salvation of his soul. And all the sins he may commit from murder to idolatry will not make his soul in any more danger. You think about that. Do you see why they're so popular? You see why they, they gather the big crowds? If that's not shocking enough, listen to this Baptist preacher by the name of Bill Foster. He said, if I killed my wife and mother and debauched a thousand women, I couldn't go to hell. In fact, I couldn't go to hell if I wanted to. That's pretty blatant. So they answer the question, can you continue in sin that grace may abound? Well, yes. You can't go to hell even if you wanted to once you're saved. In fact, this not only has a spiritual consequence, it has a physical consequence as well. In 2009, August 5th, 2009, a man by the name of George Sidno, or Sidney said this. He was 48 years old, or he did this. Uh, you may remember him in the news. He opened fire on an exercise class of women in Pittsburgh in a, a gymnasium, killing three people and himself. After he killed the three women, then he turned on the gun on himself and killed himself. He murdered four people. Here's what he said on his blog before he committed these uh, heinous acts of murder. I need to remain focused and absorbed completely. Last time I tried this in January, I chickened out. Let's see, that, let's see how this new approach works. Maybe soon I will see God in Jesus. At least this is what I was told. Eternal life does not depend on works. If it did, we would all be in hell. Christ paid for every sin, so how can I or any be judged by God for a sin when the penalty was already paid? People judge, but that does not matter. I was reading the Bible and a book called The Integrity of God yesterday, beginning yesterday, because soon I will see them. That's what he said in his blog before he went and killed three people, including himself, because he said, I'm already forgiven. And that's what they teach. They teach the moment you enter into salvation... Every sin that you committed in the past is forgiven. Every sin that you'll ever commit in the future is already forgiven. So it matters not what you do. You're already forgiven of any sin you commit in the future because Christ paid the price. So it will result not only in spiritual tragedy, it resulted in people's death here. False doctrine is dangerous not only spiritually but also physically. Shall we continue in sin that grace may abound? Let's look at the biblical answer. Back to Romans chapter 6 and verse 2. Certainly not. How shall we who died to sin live any longer in it? Now notice the answer of Paul. Certainly not. Absolutely not. That, that phrase in Greek is a very strong phrase. It's used 15 times in the New Testament. Paul uses it 14 times. and 12 instances, he uses it as a rejection of a false conclusion. One commentator said this, let it, be, let it not be, by no means, far from it. Let not such a thing be mentioned. Any of these are the meaning of the Greek phrase, which is the expression of surprise. That's why in most translations there is an explanation uh, point after the word certainly not or God forbid. That's the wrong conclusion to come to. One other Greek writer said this, in other words, this is the kind of thing that is so absurd that it shouldn't even enter the believer's mind as a possibility. That's what the Greek is saying here. That's so ridiculous you should not even let that enter into your brain. It's wrong. 
That's the wrong conclusion. We cannot continue in sin that grace may abound. That's why the um, other translations, the older ones, like uh, uh, the uh, King James Version, an American Standard Version, I think, they say, God forbid. The word God is not in the original Greek there. The Greek word for God, theos, is not there. But that was an old, old English expression. God forbid means absolutely not. You don't come to the conclusion that just because God's grace is greater than sin, you should sin some more, that grace may abound. No, that is the wrong conclusion to come to. And here's an explanation why, chapter uh, chapter 6 and verse 2, how shall we who died to sin live any longer in it? See, in becoming a Christian, you die to sin. That's repentance. Verse 3, or do you not know? As many of us as were baptized into Christ Jesus were baptized into His death. He takes their mind back to their conversion. Don't you remember that when you became a Christian, you died to sin and you were buried in baptism? It is the wrong conclusion to come to that now that you're a Christian, you can live any way you want. And there are members of the church who would not teach this doctrine, but they live this way. They cuss with them, they drink with them, they smoke with them, they engage in all kinds of activity with the world as if God is going to overlook it. And that's a false conclusion to come to. You see, when we became a Christian, we repented. Repentance is a change of mind resulting in a change of life. We have changed direction. We're going another direction now. And then we were baptized, immersed in water. Colossians 3 and verse 1 speaks of us being risen with Christ. We are to now seek those things that are above. We're to be spiritually minded now, not set our minds on the things of the world. Colossians 3 and verse 3, For you died and your life is hidden with Christ in God. Colossians 2 and verse 12, Buried with Him in baptism, in which you were also raised with Him through faith in the working of God, who raised Him from the dead. 1 Peter 3 and verse 21, Peter makes it very clear there is an antitype which also now saves us. Baptism, not the removal of the filth of the flesh, but the answer of a good conscience toward God through the resurrection of Jesus Christ. One commentator said, we have become legally dead to sin. Legally dead to sin when we become a Christian. We repented. That's why Peter said in Acts 2 and verse 38, repent and be baptized. Could it be that there's so much watered-down teaching about repentance from the pulpits? Could that be the reason why people think they can continue in sin that grace may abound? That we have reduced repentance down to just feeling bad? Feel bad about how you live and be baptized. You've got to feel bad about how you live. You've got to turn away from it. Then you be baptized. Because it's a change of mind resulting in a change of life. Back to our text, Romans chapter 6, verses 3 and 4. He said, Do you not know that as many of us as were baptized, immersed into Christ, were immersed into His death? Therefore, we are buried with Him through immersion into death. That just as Christ was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father, even so we also should walk in newness of life. See, we are baptized into His death. Because it is there in His death He bore our sins. 1 Peter 2 and verse 24, Who Himself, talking about Jesus, bore our sins in His own body on the tree, that we, having died to sin, might live for righteousness, by whose stripes we are healed. Therefore our life is hidden with Christ in God. Colossians 3 and verse 3. And Paul says in Galatians 3 and verse 27, As many of you as were baptized into Christ have put on Christ. Christ. We're baptized into His death, but it doesn't stop there. Just as Jesus didn't stop there at the tomb, He was resurrected on the third third day, raised by the glory of the Father, even so we should walk in newness of life. We are raised to a new life in Christ. We're not saved to sin. We're saved to serve the Lord. And to keep ourselves as far away from sin as possible. 
Galatians 2 and verse 20, Paul says, I have been crucified with Christ. It is no longer I who live, but Christ lives in me. And the life which I now live in the flesh, I live by faith in the Son of God, who loved me and gave himself for me. 2 Corinthians 5 and verse 17, Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. Old things have passed away. Behold, all things have become new. Now look at verse 5, Romans chapter 6 and verse 5. For if we have been united together in the likeness of His death, certainly we also shall be in the likeness of His resurrection. You notice back in verse 4 it says, We arise to walk in newness of life. That shows the necessity of water baptism in God's plan of salvation. We are raised to a new life. The new life does not happen before you're baptized. That's why Jesus said in Mark 16 and verse 16, He that believes and is baptized shall be saved. That's why Jesus said to Nicodemus in John 3 and verse 5, you've got to be born of water, that's baptism, and the Spirit, that's the Holy Spirit, or you cannot enter the kingdom of heaven. Therefore, we see the necessity of baptism. Acts 22 and verse 16, Why are you waiting? Arise and be baptized and wash away your sins, calling on the name of the Lord. So if we have been united together in the likeness of His death, that's repentance before baptism, we shall also be in the likeness of His resurrection. That's coming up out of the waters of baptism into a new life. Look at verse 6 and 7. Knowing this, that our old man was crucified with Him, that the body of sin might be done away with, that we should no longer be slaves of sin. For he who has died has been freed from sin. So we see here that we have put to death the old person, buried that old person in a watery grave, and now we are raised to a new life. To live a life in harmony with God's will. Galatians 5 and verse 24. Those who are Christ have crucified the flesh and the passions and desires. Romans chapter 8 verses 12 and 13. Therefore, brethren... We are debtors not to the flesh to live according to the flesh. For if we live according to the flesh, we will die. But if by the Spirit you put to death the deeds of the body, you will live. He's talking about spiritual death there. And that does away with the concept of once saved, always saved. We, if we live in the flesh, can spiritually die, be separated from God. So we now have a new life in Christ, which takes place after we are raised from the watery grave of baptism. Back to Romans chapter 6, verse 7 says, For he who died has been freed from sin. We die to sin and we're now alive unto God. Now, look at verse 8. For if we have died with Christ, we believe that we shall also live with Him, knowing that the that Christ, having been raised from the dead, dies no more. Death no longer has dominion over him. For the death that he died, he died to sin once for all. But the life that he lives, he lives to God. We died to sin so that we might live to God. Jesus died for our sins. We die to sin and now we live for God. That's why Paul tells us in Ephesians 2, 4 through 6, But God, who is rich in mercy because of His great love with which He loved us, even when we were dead in trespasses, made us to get alive together with Him by grace you have been saved, and raised us up together and made us to sit together in heavenly places in Christ. Raised us up. That's talking about baptism. That's when we're raised up. And that's when we're in Christ. We have to understand the importance of this in the plan of salvation. Being alive to God, we offer ourselves as instruments of righteousness. Look at verses 11 through 13 of Romans chapter 6. Likewise, you also reckon yourselves dead indeed to sin, but alive to God in Christ Jesus our Lord. Shall we continue in sin that grace may abound? No. You're dead to sin. Now you're alive In Christ Jesus our Lord. Therefore do not let sin reign in your mortal bodies that you should obey its lust. And do not present your members as instruments of unrighteousness to sin. But present yourself to God as being alive from the dead and your members as instruments of righteousness to God. 
We are now new people in Christ, and we are to live apart from sin, dead to sin. We understand very simply that the Bible teaches that we are the temple of the Holy Spirit now. Acts 2 and verse 38, when we receive the forgiveness of sins, we receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. In Acts 5 and verse 32, God gives the Holy Spirit to those who obey Him. And Paul tells us in 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 19 and 20, Or do you not know that your body is the temple of the Holy Spirit who is in you, whom you have from God? And you are not your own. You were bought at a price. Therefore glorify God in your body and your spirit, which belongs to God. So we see here very clearly in this passage that we have the Holy Spirit in us. We know that by faith. Not by feeling. By faith we know that. The Bible tells us and that's how we know. And when we live in harmony with the Holy Spirit's words found in the New Testament, we are each day walking in the Spirit. Now look at verse 14. For sin shall not have dominion over you, because you're not under law, but under grace. Very misunderstood passage there. We're not under law for the basis or the foundation of our salvation. We're under grace for the basis and foundation for our salvation. But that grace itself is a law. How do I know? Romans chapter 8, verse 1 and 2. Same book, same author. Who's saying, the law of the Spirit of life in Christ Jesus has made you free from the law of sin and death. So the gospel of grace is a law. It's not the same type of law as the law of Moses, but yet it is a law. But we're not saved based upon the law of Moses or based upon simple law keeping. We must obey the will of God, which is law, and therefore we receive grace and mercy. Nothing indeed is earned. So we see here the importance of living faithful to the Lord. Grace does not encourage sin. It outlaws it, one author said. It doesn't encourage sin. It outlaws it in our life. Therefore, how should we respond to this? What should be our response to this so that we might answer affirmatively, not only by our words, no, you shouldn't live in sin that grace may abound, but by our life. We have to live a dedicated life in response to God's will. We have to submit to God and resist the devil. Remember what Paul said in this text. Don't let sin reign in your mortal bodies. If we let sin do that, we've opened the door. God doesn't force, or excuse me, the devil doesn't force us to do anything. God has given us a choice. And we can let sin in our life. James chapter 4 and verse 7, Submit to God, resist the devil, and he will flee from you. Peter warns us in 1 Peter chapter 5, verse 8 and 9, Be sober, be vigilant, because your adversary, the devil, walks about as like a roaring lion, seeking whom he may devour. Resist him steadfast in the faith, knowing that the same sufferings are experienced by your brotherhood in the world. We must submit ourselves to the will of God, And as a result of that, we will live holy lives. Romans chapter 12, verse 1 and 2. I beseech you therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice, wholly acceptable to God, which is your reasonable service. And do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind, that you may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. We are to be holy We submit ourselves to the will of God, and as a result of that complete dedication, we are holy, we are set apart for God's work. God told His people in Deuteronomy 7 and verse 6, You be holy. Leviticus 11 and verse 45, You be holy, for I am holy. And all throughout the book of Leviticus, you see that phrase, You be holy, because I am holy. Therefore, we understand under the law of Christ, 1 Peter chapter 2 and verse 9, we are a chosen generation, a royal priesthood. We as the church are a holy nation. And Peter tells us 
echoing the same thing that's found in the Old Testament. 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 15 and 16. He who called you is holy. You also be holy in all your conduct. That means what we entertain ourselves with. That means who we run with. That means where we go. That means what we look at on the internet. That means when we're in public. That means when we're in private. In all your conduct, you be holy. Because it is written, be holy for I am am holy. Having these promises, beloved, let us cleanse ourselves from all the filth of the flesh and spirit, perfecting holiness in the sight of God, or in the fear of God. 2 Corinthians chapter 7 and verse 1. We have to have this attitude. Here's the practical application of being holy. Shall we continue in sin that grace may abound? No. We're to be a holy people. How? Genesis chapter 39 and verse 10, when temptation sets itself forth to you, you run. You have to have the same attitude as Joseph has. How can I do this great wickedness and sin against God? It doesn't matter if you're with your friends. It doesn't matter if you're with your relatives. It doesn't matter that everyone's doing it. Joseph had the attitude, how can I do this great wickedness and sin against God? against God. And you know, when you have God's Word in your heart, you will always have that moral compass to know whether what you're doing is right or wrong. Psalm 119 and verse 11, Your Word I have hid in my heart that I might not sin against you. When we take the message of this book and get it up here, in our heart, and it becomes a habit of life. It becomes the, the part of our life that, that, that is extensive. It permeates every facet of our, of our existence and every decision we make. We will live holy lives before the Lord. We will not continue in sin that grace may abound. We understand The things that we have done in the past are contrary to the will of God. But I want want to close with this verse because it will be a segue into tonight's sermon. Romans chapter 6 and verse 22. But now having been set free from sin and having become slaves of God, we're no longer slaves of sin. You have your fruit to holiness and the end, everlasting life. Bearing fruit for God. That's what we're going to talk about tonight. Lord willing. Shall we continue in sin that grace may abound? No. We died to sin. We're alive to God. But that's only true if you're a Christian. If there's anyone here who has not been baptized into Christ for the forgiveness of their sins, you need to confess your faith in Christ. Repent. Die to sin. And bury that old person in the watery grave of baptism. Be cleansed by the blood and rise to walk a new life. Rise from the watery grave. Not to go back to sin. But to become a servant, a slave of God under righteousness. If you've done that and you've gone astray, you're you're living in sin. Once again, you're, you're back in it. Repent. Come back to the Lord. As always, the choice is yours. While we stand and say.